This is the third installment of our Learning Our Landscape presentation series where we partnered, uh, the North Olympic History Center has partnered with the Jamestown Squalum Tribe this year. Um, so I'm very excited today to welcome uh, Closton Mackenzie Grinnell from the Jamestown Squalum Tribe. Uh, Mackenzie's from the Prince family of the Jamestown Squalum Tribe. He's the son of Jack Grinnell and the grandson of Elaine Grinnell. And if we figured out things correctly, the seventh great grandson direct descendant from Chief Chichmahan. Um, so without further ado, uh, what we're going to do is have Mac play a video that he recorded uh, of him doing a virtual walk through the woods. Um, so if you, <clears throat> we're going to try and get the video to play. It might be a little glitchy in the visual, but if you turn up the uh, volume, you should be able to hear the audio. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Mac. Thank you. Yeah, welcome everybody. I'm uh, really happy to be able to do a plant walk again. It's been a long time since, um, well, we're still not gathering in person, obviously. Um, so I thought I would try doing a little video recording and seeing how that works. So um, if you're taking notes, take notes of all your questions. I will be here after the video for, I don't know, however long I, I need to be to answer everyone's questions. So um, make sure you write them down so you don't forget. So I'm gonna get this started and yeah, thanks for watching. My name is Austin Mackenzie Grinnell, and we're going to go on a plant walk today. Uh, so I'm really glad that you're here, and I wish you could be here in person, but that's okay. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful day. It's very cold, but here we go. Um, well, I guess first thing before we start before we start walking, um, I wanted to like talk about where these plants come from and kind of like our relationship with them as uh, new sky and people, sky and people, is that we our our people have been here since time immemorial, meaning we've been here forever, and we've watched these over here is the bay. We've watched this bay form. It used to be you know probably a field or like a big valley and a prairie or something like that, and we watch these forests form and we watch these, all these plants come, come here, you know, even these invasive ones over the last, I don't know, 100 years. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen the rise of, of this plant. Uh, is this is Scotch Broom. Um, I'm sure we've all seen this spread across the state and across our, you know, our region and our territory. But um, in that same way, our ancestors watched all these plants come, come to this territory, and along with that, help them integrate into the this this landscape. And our ancestors are part of that integration because as we go out and harvest, as we go out and hunt. We are always interacting with the world. We're always interacting with the trees. We plant things, we move seeds. And in that way, as we look back at these hills over here, we can see these as giant gardens because they were planted, they were moved there, they were pruned, and we grew these giant forests. So, you know, going from what we have in our yard is like these little gardens to what our ancestors had as gardens is, you know, our whole world. Um, and so that's our relationship as native peoples with these plants is that our ancestors knew them hundreds of generations before us and we've held that knowledge and are reclaiming it and regaining that knowledge um, and so I'm here to share a little bit with you and I'm not going to share everything because for so long or I guess you know 150 200 years um, non-native people have taken the knowledge that we've had and abused it and killed off so many of our plants or taken that knowledge and then made it illegal to harvest different plants and so i'm not going to tell you everything i'm not going to tell you some or i'm not going to point out some plants that as native peoples that we would only use and i'll, I'll point out some that that we can only use in ways and non-native people can't use in ways so as this as we have this video and or as we go down this walk, um, 
I hope you get to learn something about the plants that are around you and and our relationship with them and how you can have a relationship with them as well. Um, we are on, I guess to say where we are, we're on the Olympic Discovery Trail. Back here used to be Jamestown Skalm Tribe's library um, and we are going to be building a new one and also be putting in a museum in there as well which Bonnie can tell you a lot more about and I assume she's going to be here somewhere um, so ask her all those questions and yeah so if you want to kind of follow along with this walk you can you know get it on, get a video of it and walk down this trail or just kind of remember things take notes because all these plants are are really everywhere but if you want to see them specifically here um, come on down and enjoy this trail because you know it's here for everybody so let's get started <laughs> Um, I guess we can start here. Um, this plant is called ironwood or ocean spray, and it's been used for well, it's been used for a lot of a lot of different ways. But you can identify it by these little dead flowers here at this time of year, early early spring, late winter. And somebody told me that they kind of look like dirty socks hanging on, a, on the branches. And I don't know if I, you know, I don't even know why I told you that. Because they're so pretty. They're not dirty socks. Don't call them dirty socks. Scratch that from your mind. Um, but, they, but they're really distinguished by this. And, and the, when they're flowering, they're these big white droops of flowers. And they're throughout these, like the lowlands here. And from really the water's edge up into like the prairies and the foothills. And you could find them a lot of places and what we use these for we call them ironwood because the wood is so hard and they make great like fire pokers or tongs to grab coals out of the fire or fish sticks and a bunch of different things and the you know you can use the leaves and the barks for different things and and just with well i guess with any plant you can use every piece of the plant in different ways um and ironwood you know, is no exception, as long with, along with everything else that we're about to talk about, but that's the first plant, ironwood. So I hope you learned what that is or learned something, I don't know. Um, I guess next, God, see, we walked like four feet and we haven't, we are talking about some, oh, okay. Um, this is Salal, I don't know if that's too close. Um, and it has really leathery leaves and you'll see it very similar places to um, ironwood, maybe higher elevation as well. But it has berries, which are edible. And I always get people saying like, oh my gosh, I didn't know you can eat that. And it's so good, but you really have to go to a couple different patches of Salau to taste a few different kinds, because depending on where the plants are, the, the berries will taste different. So this patch of Salau might taste different than the patch on the other side of the trail or farther down on the trail. So, and they're, they taste so good. It's almost like, sometimes it kind of tastes cardamom -y or like kind of, kind of like mulling spices. And sometimes they just taste like more like blackberries. They're like the flavor on them is like has such a range, but um, I think this was my favorite berry a couple years ago and I ate so many of them. I have, you can make syrups out of them and all sorts of things. And the leaves are really good. Um, if you extract like the medicine from them, you can, they're really good for skin irritation, like you soak this in oil and things like that. Um, and they're also fire resistant. They're not fireproof, but we traditionally use the leaves when we make um, pit ovens for like clams and oysters and things like that. And also like root vegetables, like camas. We would, you know, build a fire in a pit and then, or build, dig a pit, line it with rocks and build a fire in it. And after we scrape off all the coals, this would be the first plant we lay down on it because it won't catch on fire. And then we pile everything else on top and bury it. But that's its superpower is that it doesn't catch on fire very easily. And then right next to it, I'm breaking off a bunch of these. Also, here's, here's a little trail tip, trail advice. Maybe not on this trail, but on like walk, like single per like one person walking trails like in the woods and things like that while you're walking if you 
if there's something like that's cr growing into the trail, just break off little pieces as you keep walking and that'll kind of help maintain the trail so it doesn't just become overgrown and abandoned or it won't cause too much work for the trail crew. Um, okay, so this is sword fern. And you can tell, well, it's called sword fern for, I don't know, a few different reasons maybe, but you can kind of see that it has this long stem so this comes off the main stem, but individually, then it has this little side thing right here. And it's kind of like a guard on a sword. So it kind of looks like a tiny little sword. And then on the back, it has these little bumps on it. And those are, I think like spores. I'm actually not positive what they are, but what it can do um, is if you get stung by stinging nettle, if you peel off all these orange little dots, you can kind of rub that on a stinging nettle sting and it will kind of dampen the sting. Does it work? It's never worked for me, but it has worked for people I've talked to. So I don't know, give it a try. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, um, there's a lot of other things. You know, I'll probably talk about some other things that help stings, so. Uh, but that's sword fern, it grows, it grows everywhere. Um, traditionally, we would eat the roots out of it, but um, they're not super tasty and they're so like, they're, I don't know, it has a big root ball, but they're not super tasty, so it wasn't like the first root we'd go after. Um, I've tried them. What do they taste like? I don't really remember, but they were okay. Medium okay. Don't go dig up a bunch of them, but so you know. Um, we talked about this already. You can you can pull as many of these off as you want. This is, um, oh crap, what's it called? Scotch broom. Um, and they're super invasive. They're really hard to pull from the ground. Um, but when they're small, you can pull them. So don't wait until they get this big because you'll need like a special like tool to really yank it out of the ground. But as you walk, especially like next to the river, next to the Railroad Bridge Park, um, if you're walking in those little river channels, if you see these and they're little, pull them out. Pull as many as you can. Um, that was one of my first jobs growing up I worked at the, I worked at the river center and you know I helped count salmon and work with kids and go on bird walks and do landscaping things like that but then if I ran out of things to do which like I don't, which is hard to do but for it seems like four hours a day I would just pull this and you know it comes back really fast the seeds are there's no seed pods on them right they're kind of fuzzy. They kind of look like pea pods, but um, the seeds are viable for, I think over seven years and they're really hard to get rid of. I don't even think, I think burning them is like one of the best way to get rid of them and deactivate the seeds. Um, but if you can pull them when they're small, do that. And now we'll go another foot down the trail. And what do we have here? Uh, this is Nooka Rose. And I, this is something that as you, if you walk a, a specific trail throughout the year, you're gonna start noticing what the plants look like throughout the seasons. And so a good way to tell this is that it has thorns um, and it's really stabby. The second way is that it'll probably have some leftover rose hips and they'll be all kind of dried and crusty. When, they're, when you wanna harvest these to eat them, they're gonna be red and big and juicy. And actually, you can harvest these rose hips when the petals are still on the the flat, or when the petals are still there and the flower is still there. The rose hips actually are under it. So if you harvest the rose hip and the petals, you can use the petals for making like rose water or something like that. And then you can eat these. You don't eat the seeds on the inside. They kind of they have this like really fuzziness. I don't know if that's going to be viewable, but um, it's kind of like. Um, God, what's the insulation that's made out of glass? Fiberglass. <laughs> it's like fiberglass insulation where if, if this is dry and you get it on your skin, it kind of just irritates your skin and then it's impossible to get out until it just, your skin naturally pulls it out. Um, but there's also other ways to pull it out, which we'll get to that. Um, so when you, when, you when you use these, you want to pull out all of these, you want to wear gloves, and then you can eat the outsides and just the skin and the little bit of flesh around it and it's really high in vitamin C. It's really good for you. I, 
think like by weight for like an orange to rose hips, it's like 35% more vitamin C. So it's like a, it's a super food that we have. So, you know, you just have like a little handful of these a day and you're good. And also if you don't want to peel them and do all that, you can just take the rose hips when they're fresh and dry them and then just make tea out of them. And then you don't have to process them. And then you have like a kind of like a vitamin C thing. So instead of using emergency, you can just make rose hip tea and it'll make you get over a boost your immune system and you know, do all that, you know, you know what that is. Okay, now we'll walk another like three feet. Like four feet, I don't know. Um, this is, <laughs> I'll squat down. <laughs> this is Oregon grape. And here's a little story about that. Um, I just ordered, well, I accidentally ordered a hundred Oregon grape from the conservation district because I got really excited when they first opened up their how to buy them. And apparently that first week, it's only for organizations or people doing restoration work. And it only comes in packs of a hundred. And I was like, well, I can't use a hundred elderberries. I can't use a hundred of these other things. And I was like, Oregon grape, sure. I can use a hundred of those. Um, yeah, we planted, we planted 90 of them and we gave 10 away, but they, oh, here's a little plug for the conservation district. The Oregon grapes were huge. They were like this big. So, and they had these big root systems, so I assume they're all gonna live, but, you know, I guess I got 90 of them, so if half of them live, that's still a lot, so. Um, but Oregon grapes, they are edible also, kind of like salal, a lot of people say like, oh, I didn't know you can eat that. Um, but in the berries, or I guess the berries, and the berries kind of grow in these big droops, which I, probably why they call them grapes. Um, but they're really bitter and sour, um, so if you mix them with other berries and you can make like a jelly out of them or kind of in the same way that crab apples are really tart and sour and that you mix a bunch of sugar in them you make apple jelly or apple yeah apple jelly um, you can do that with Oregon grapes um, and if you don't want to use a bunch of sugar just mix them in with a bunch of other berries and make jams and stuff um, the leaves in the early spring which they haven't started coming out with yet but they're like lime green and they're really high in vitamin C also. Early, early spring, you can basically close your eyes and point to something and it has vitamin C in it and you can eat it. Actually, no, don't, don't, <laughs> don't do that. Don't walk in the woods and eat everything. But there is a lot of things that have vitamin C in early spring that you can eat. Um, once they start getting this, you can, I guess you can still make tea out of them. It'll probably be really bitter. And that's because as these grow out and they get exposed to the sun, the plant starts making tannins. And that's what also is in wine that make, gives it more complex flavors. But in the leaves, it protects it from the sun and they get hard and bitter. But when they're really young, they're not bitter and they're really tasty. Um, you can make, I've made, I've used them and made like, they're kind of lemony and you kind of make lemonade out of them and you substitute lemons for, um, Oregon grape leaves. And when you harvest these, those leaves, you want to leave the, the top few, so like on this thing, you would leave, I don't know, the top six leaves and you could harvest the ones under it and it'll keep growing and keep producing more leaves. And you don't want to harvest, you know, all the leaves off this one, take a couple from this one, go over here, take a couple from that one, and then go down the trail and get some more. Um, yeah, and then, oh, also I guess with harvesting, um, we're on the Olympic Discovery Trail. There's dogs going along this trail and peeing probably on this bush. So you probably don't want to harvest this. So go off the trail a little bit and then you can harvest things. Um, and where and what can you harvest? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that's something you gotta look up yourself. I know what we can harvest as Jamestown citizens and where we can harvest, but for, I guess, those of you that are non-indigenous, non-Jamestown, or non-Squalum, Qualum, um, where to look that up? I don't know. You're on your own, I'm sorry. I guess I, can, I might be able to come up with some answers by the time we watch this together. <laughs> um, okay, but more about organ grape is the, there's two different kinds. There's a tall organ grape and a short organ grape, or low organ grape. Um, this is the short one and the tall one. They can get really tall. They can probably get taller than this. And inside, 
the inside the bark is yellow like the stem is yellow just under the bark and it's yellow because it's has berberine in it and berberine god it's good for something it's good for <laughs> it's a bitter and it's so it's it's really good for helping you with digestion and things like that also here's here's something i'll probably say this like 500 times so you gotta watch out for this if something's bitter and you eat it it's just good for digestion it helps your gallbladder put out bile and that which like starts digestion and does all that um and that's what bitters do and so organ grape is our natural bitter so you have like a big hamburger that's greasy and fatty and you feel bloated and gross and disgusting but really happy because you just ate a burger um if you have some bitters so like organ grape bark um it'll help get that process going and you won't feel gross for a long time which is very nice i've done it and it sure does help you could also get it going before it'd probably be better if you like i'm gonna eat a big burger let's get a bitters let's eat it let's eat some more and then it'll move through faster that's oregon grape and i guess there's so many things i probably we probably don't even need to move um but i guess we'll keep walking to the other side of the trail um this is himalayan blackberry which I'm sure you all know, um, and if you don't, it's it's everywhere. It's the, it forms like these big mounds across, next to roads and in fields. Um, really invasive. I don't. Is it from the Himalayas? I don't know actually, um, but it's very distinctive, especially compared to our native blackberry, because this grows up and in big mounds where our native blackberry grows really close to the ground and it, it kind of if there's something if there's a bunch of brush it might grow on top of the brush so it might kind of look like it's growing in a big mound but it's really just growing on top of things where this can grow straight up um i think we're gonna pass a place where there's blackberry and there's just one stalk going straight up and it's like 10 feet tall and it'll start bending over once it gets leaves and wind and stuff but it gets very big it has great blackberries so i get this is something that you can harvest every single berry you can off of to hopefully like over harvest so it hopefully won't spread it's going to keep spreading because there's birds eating the ones in the middle of those big bushes but harvest as many as you can um which also i guess gets me to my next point is that when you go out and harvest i forgot it, i yeah when you go out and harvest you don't want to harvest too much the general rule of thumb is you want to harvest one tenth of the population so with the slough here there's you know this slough here goes up that hill right over here but if we kind of do the 10 percent idea if there's slough right here you only harvest one tenth of this area and you go a little farther and one tenth and one tenth and one tenth so and you don't want what you don't want to do is like oh this this area is 100 square feet so i'm just going to harvest everything in this one tenth square foot area because then you're just over harvesting this one side and especially if you're harvesting on the edge of this one bush of salau then it'll this is kind of like a guard pushing off all these other different plants that want to kind of take its space but so if you kind of step inside and kind of harvest around the edges or not not on the edge then it'll be able to kind of hold its space and be salau for a lot longer so I want to harvest 10%, harvest in places that dogs aren't peeing and pooping, um, and then go figure out what you can harvest and when you can harvest it. Yeah. What else? Yeah. That's right. That's it. Um, this... What is this? I'm not sure what this is. This is a tree. Um... I am still learning about how to identify trees when they're really little. So if you look at the bark on this and look at these leaf buds, I guess the leaf buds are always going to kind of look similar, but the bark on young trees is a lot different than on the same tree that's a lot older. And I think we'll see some trees farther down the trail that do that. So like, or no, it's um, Douglas fir does that when it's really little, the bark is really smooth, but as they get really big, they're really known for having this bit really furrowed bark. It has, which has all the cracks in the tree and everything. But we'll get to that when we get to that. That's just a little, um, 
preview. I don't know. It's a little trailer for what's come. What's coming? Huh. Okay. Here's. This is our native blackberries. So you'll see it's just kind of going across the ground. It's kind of coming up. But you'll see that the. This is about as thick as the, the stock gets. It might get a little bit thicker, but it has really. I mean, it has thorns. It has similar leaves. The flowers look different which I can explain if I could see both of them, but I can't because it's not flowering season. But um, this is our native blackberry. And actually where we are in Blinn, actually where the, kind of where the casino and hotel is, um, that used to be one of our traditional blackberry gathering areas. And we would set up fish traps in Jimmy Come Lately Creek and we'd go pick a bunch of blackberries. And every few years we would burn the whole blackberry field. And that would, you know, as you know, if this was a blackberry field, I guess we would consider these weeds as this grass, this allow um, these little trees growing up. And so we would burn it and all those weeds would go away and the blackberries would be one of the first things that come back. And you can kind of see that in um, clear cuts. If you go up into DNR land, you'll see a bunch of slough and you'll see a bunch of fireweed and you'll see a bunch of trailing blackberry. Oh, that's what it's called, trailing blackberry or native blackberry or well, I guess if not native blackberry, because as you go different places in the world, I guess they would say it's not native there. I don't know. Here's another plant. Um, this plant dies back every year. This is bracken fern, and it can get really tall. I remember when I was little and I was hiking through the park. I it, I mean I was I wasn't that. That wasn't that tall, but I remember these being like 40 feet tall. They're probably like 10 feet tall, but it was walking through like a forest of them. It was like in Jurassic Park. It was so cool, but um, they get really tall. They can grow in big bun bunches or they could kind of grow out through a bunch of other shrubbery. And they, we use them in pit cooking. Like I was talking about with Salau, that's more fireproof. This would kind of go on next and kind of be more insulation to keep the steam in to cook everything. Um, you can also eat the roots, but as a disclaimer, um, the roots have been linked to stomach cancer, I think. Some kind of cancer of like your throat or stomach. Um, but yeah. The study that, that found that out was pretty unsubstantial. It's kind of like the study that like got people to be anti-vaxxers that like wasn't peer reviewed and wasn't like really founded in good science. Um, and now people are anti-vaxxers and then we had this pandemic. So if you're not vaccinated, go get vaccinated. Um, but with that, in the same way, there's, they were just, they were just searching out people that ate bracken fern roots every single day in abundance. And they do that a lot in um, South Korea. And they found out that it's causing stomach cancer. Um, so I'm not saying go out and eat a bunch of this and you'll be fine. But um, if you're a scientist, you should do another study and see, um, see if it's true or not. Because that would be helpful to have more than one study on this. That's bracken fern. This plant right here is one of the first ones to bloom. And wait, it's already losing its flowers because, but here's some of them. And if you, s <laughs> I had Emma who was filming, thank you, um, <laughs> smell this earlier, um, <laughs> just so she can experience it. But I'll tell you all before you smell it that it kind of smells like cat pee. Um, and it smells that way for a reason because at this time of the year, the bees aren't coming out yet because it's too cold and they're still hibernating. Um, and what is out that can pollinate right now are little flies and little insects like that. And that's why this smells like cat pee is because it's attracting a different kind of insect than a bee. Um, and you might see bees on it too because there is nectar and, and all that. But um, not something that you want to give somebody a bouquet and have them take a big sniff out because it's gross. But this, these little greens are one of the first greens too and 
I'll take a couple of these. And they, this is a, a pretty big leaf, but when you, the leaves are really small like this, I'll do comparison, big leaf, small leaf. Um, and actually right now is kind of past the time of harvesting these leaves, but they taste like cucumbers. And as they grow bigger and the leaves get bigger, they taste like cucumber skin and get bitter, which is good for digestion. So if you um, have upset tummy, go eat some of these. Or you guys see you guys eat cucumber skin. Um, but really great, you can harvest these and you can freeze them. And then if you want cucumber water throughout the summer, you just throw them into your water bottle. Or right now, if you're going around biking, throw some of these in your water bottle. Um, what are they, what kind of nutrients are in them? I don't know. I would say vitamin C, but I, <laughs> I really don't know. <laughs> but they're tasty. I'll eat one for you. Mm, that's really bitter. But it tastes exactly like a cucumber. It's uncanny. Um, yeah, so this is called Indian plum. And in the early summer, it gets these tiny little berries that look kind of like small plums. And that's why they call it Indian plum. And they have a big pit in them. And you don't eat the pits. You just eat the flesh and the, the skin around it. And you can spit out the pits. But they're pretty tasty. And they kind of taste cucumbery. So, which is like a weird, it's like a cucumber berry. Um, but you know, I guess you could also throw that in your water bottle and you have like cucumber berry water. Yeah, I gotta try that. I haven't tried that, but I'm sure it's gonna be delicious. Um, yeah, so that's Indian plum. Very tasty. One of the first things, one of the first signs of spring. Um, so spring is here. Sorry, Punxkatani, Punxkatani Phil. Oh, he died. <laughs> Sorry, groundhog. Spring's here. I don't know if he predicted that. I, I don't know. Um, what's over here? So right now we're getting a lot of these little greens popping up in everybody's yard. And this, does everyone know what this is? You probably do. A lot of people, you know, really don't like this plant. This is dandelion. Can I put my hand behind it? Is that better? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is dandelion which um here's a little fun fact before i tell you what it's good for um back in i don't know a long time ago the ussr so i guess in that era um they were breeding dandelion for the you know when you break off the dandelion head the little white milk comes out it has a little bit of natural latex in it and so they were breeding dandelion to increase the amount of latex in the plant. And I don't know whatever happened to that. I guess it didn't really work out because I'm pretty sure we don't get our latex from dandelion. Um, we probably just get it from oil or something. I don't know. Silkworms? That's, that's silk. Um, but that's a little fun fact about dandelion. Um, it is really good for you, especially right now when these leaves, you see how, like, how bright green this is, kind of lime green. Also, the kind of the color of all the early early leaves that you want to get is one of this color. And as they get darker green, that's when they have more tannins, they become more bitter. But right now, with this, this light green, it's really good in salads. And you can put it in pestos, you can put it in a bunch of different things. But try it in a salad. And don't, here's, here's something to get more wild foods in your diet. If you're going to make a salad, don't make it only out of dandelion greens, because you probably won't like it. But so get the greens that you're used to and then go harvest some dandelion and add it into it. And then maybe over time, add more and more. And then maybe one day you'll be eating only dandelion greens in a salad. But if you try it all dandelion greens the first time, odds are you won't like it. Or if you're feeding it to your kids or somebody who's kind of picky, they, they I don't want to say definitely, but they probably won't like it because it's probably kind of gross. But it's really tasty right now. Oh. Don't eat that. Dogs peed there. <laughs> oh gosh, I gotta keep her. <laughs> Emma made a really yucky face. Um, what is this? I don't know what this is. I thought this was yarrow, but it's not yarrow. I don't know, it kind of looks like a carrot family, which I guess um, I'll say now. You have to be really careful with carrot family because 
this might not be actually in the carrot family but it kind of looks like it um, because there's we have things in our area that are extremely poisonous in the carrot family and things in the carrot family look very similar so from a wild carrot to poison hemlock it's so similar that I've heard of people in like in my university they got really excited because they went out foraging and they made something for the whole class and they well my professor told me this and it was made out of um, poison hemlock and luckily the professor caught it before the whole class got poisoned but um, that person almost sent their whole class to the hospital so only harvest anything from the carrot family so that's like you know, wild carrots, I guess that's it, wild carrots. Don't go out har harvest wild carrots unless you're with somebody who knows exactly what they're doing. And I know, I, I'm not that person. I might, I don't know, I'm not that person. Don't come harvest carrots with me, that's what I'm saying. Um, oh, also, okay, something about the dandelion um, that we were, we've been talking about in like our inner tribal like plant cohort is that we use dandelion to teach people because well so dandelion is so useful it's so resilient it can grow anywhere and it does grow everywhere um and so we use dandelion as an example that you know you're you're here you're where you're supposed to be and you know people can't get rid of you people can't put you down you're just going to keep coming back and so we use it to teach people resiliency and stick to itness, which I guess is just another word for resiliency. So if you're ever feeling down, ever feeling like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life, which probably is, for me, is happening like every day. Um, now that dandelion, <laughs> that was really sad, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but, but now that dandelion's coming up, I'm like, oh, okay, I've got this, the spring greens are coming out, the sun's coming out. Um, but now we get these little reminders that uh, we are resilient and we're gonna continue being, being here and we're gonna continue to thrive and to um, spread our wings and fly. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's my little informational, wait, no, motivational talk. This tree is um, a big leaf maple, and these are really easy to tell even when they're really young because they kind of all grow by each other. But if you look down at the ground, you're gonna find these giant leaves, um, which you know, that, which means you might be standing under a tree that's next to a big leaf maple, but you know, its bark kind of has these little stripes in it. When it's young, it's really smooth, but. This is also a good way to tell right here. There's not really any other trees. There's kind of this little tree hanging over, but all the leaves here are big leaf maple. And this is a big leaf maple. I, I know. Um, and they're, they can be used for so many things. Actually, we, um, oh, I don't think we actually got around to it. You can tap big leaf maples and there's, I just saw some, something was on the news about this big leaf maple syrup producer in like Maple Valley. So on the I-5 corridor, somewhere over there. Um, oh, somewhere over there. And they're making maple syrup and I tried getting some and they're already sold out. Um, but you can tap maples when it's, well, you want, you want a temperature um, difference during the night and day of like a pretty big temperature difference. Um, so if it's like freezing at night and then it warms up like it's really sunny right now and then it freezes again. So I guess like last night, I guess right now, go tap a maple tree and you need a lot of maple. So what comes out of it is maple water and then you boil that down until it's about 1 50th of the volume and then you get syrup. Um, but when the water comes out, it's like, it's like our, nat it's our I guess it's like our local coconut water it's full of all these vitamins and minerals that are so good for us so you know if you don't even get enough to boil down as a syrup you can just drink it right out of the tree um, and you can do that with a bunch of different trees for example in Hunger Games Katniss taps a tree and that and that's kind of a similar tap that you tap well it's the same exact thing you tap maple trees with um, which is called a spile and you hang a bucket from it and you get all your water and then you boil it down um, what else you can use the maple 
big leaf maple trees for is the sprouts that from like new branches which aren't quite here yet but if you live if you live next to a place that has cut down a maple tree you'll see all these sprouts coming out and when they're really young you can take those and peel off the skin and you can eat the insides of it and they're so good um, but if you miss that when they're really young once they start getting older they'll start getting woody kind of like a carrot if you leave a carrot in your garden for way too long it'll start just becoming wood and then you'll get all these fibers um, similar to a big leaf maple but it happens a lot faster so you have to catch them if you go on a walk every single day or once a week you'll see you'll see um, the big leaf maple sprouts come out and give one a little try especially if there's a ton of them and somebody's trying to get rid of the tree just help them out is that oh my god it's already been 40 minutes <laughs> um so for example how many trees or how many plants we have i don't know i can see the car it's like 40 yards away um wow i was really expecting to at least get around the corner um yeah we started just right there and now we're here sorry from down there and now we're here um okay well let's let's talk about one more point um okay we're gonna we're gonna walk a little, a little ways and as well as you go out and harvest things and you learn about all these different plants you're gonna start seeing them everywhere so oh so you'll like you'll see salau and if you didn't know what salau was you're like oh my gosh i haven't seen that and then you're gonna go for a walk and you're like oh that's salau and then once you identify it, you can identify it by yourself everywhere you go like oh there's salau there's salau and also salau is everywhere but you're gonna start noticing way more as you go out and harvest as you go out and recognize these plants and form a relationship with them and just kind of be outside with these plants um yeah so i guess the last plant we'll talk about is what is that i think this is i don't know what this is it's not that alder it's it's i don't think it's alder i think that's a hazelnut tree holy caca that's a big one also, it might be alder. So I don't think it's alder. So I guess here's my here's how I try to figure out how to identify plants. Alders, they have one trunk and they can have a bunch growing right next to each other. But if we look up, there's a bunch of these trunks coming out from one place. And that's something that our, I think it's called a beaked hazelnut. Um, or filbert, maybe? Um, Anyway, our hazelnuts, they all come out of this one thing and they kind of come out like this. And they have these big... These, these are called catkins. And this, I'm not positive if this is, these are male or female flowers or if they have female or female. Um, but these are called catkins and they have these that hang down. These will get pollinated and then that's where the hazelnuts come from. And they usually grow in pairs coming off. Um, and as you can see, these are, there's a bunch coming out of each section and there'll be that many hazelnuts coming out of each place. And they're really good. Something that though that you'll need if you're looking or gonna go out and harvest them, you wanna find a place that's more of a stand of hazelnuts um, with a few different ones right next to each other. Cause from my experience, if like this one, if it is indeed by itself, it looks like there's another one over there. But if it's by itself, the hazelnuts won't get um, pollinated and or they will get pollinated, but it won't. Oh, they won't get pollinated across pollination and the hazelnut, the nut itself won't form. So you'll harvest you know, a basket of hazelnuts, you'll crack them all open and you might get like one hazelnut and it's so disappointing. Um, so before you harvest a ton well, well you, won't, you won't harvest a ton from anything because you're going to harvest 10% of the entire population but or entire bounty. Um, but harvest a few, 
take a little survey, start cracking them open, like, oh, none of these have nuts in them, then you don't have to harvest all of them and you won't be so disappointed. Um, Cause that's what I did my first time harvesting them. And my fingers, well, I was using a nut cracker, but my, my hands were just so sore from just crushing so many of them. And I got like five hazelnuts. It was so disappointing. Um, yeah, so they're, they're, I guess that's the plant walk. Um, there's so many more things. And so I guess you can see that we haven't walked very far and I've just been really walking back and forth across the trail. And there's so many plants here that we can enjoy. And I hope that you're able to enjoy them a little bit more. I hope you can, I, well, I guess I didn't help you identify it. We didn't talk about identification a ton, but um, there's a lot of great resources out there. There's a lot of books, there's a lot of videos. Um, so do some research and maybe take a little ID book out in your next walk and start identifying these plants and yeah, start enjoying these trails a little bit more. And now it's sunny too, holy. So um, thank you for your time. I guess I'm gonna stick around after the video um, for questions and answers. So um, I hope you wrote down your questions um, and I'll answer them. So thank you all for, for joining us today. And yeah, I hope we can have another one of these these little, maybe it won't be virtual next time, but if it is, then I um, hope to see you again. And yeah, thank you for listening to me ramble on about plants, which I love. So.